Well, uh, we're back again for another session, and uh, it's my privilege to be here and to share with you the Word of God. Um, in our last session, we studied uh, this question, what is the chief end of man? And the answer is this, the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. That means the purpose of our life, the reason why we're here, the reason why we breathe, is to glorify God. Now today, we're going to look at what does it mean to glorify God? You know, it, it sounds really nice. It sounds like something that you would want to do, but it's important that we understand what it means to glorify God. Now, I, I want to give you the answer in two parts, and I've tried to simplify it um, so that we can understand it and actually apply it to our lives. The first part is this. To glorify God means to recognize that He is greater and more valuable and more beautiful than all other things combined, and that we will find peace and satisfaction only in Him. So to begin with, in order to glorify God, uh, we have to recognize who He is. We have to recognize His supremacy. Now I know the word supremacy is kind of big, but just look at it this way. Supremacy means that God is over everything, that He is above everything, that God is more valuable, He is more, be more beautiful, more important, uh, more lovely, more wonderful, more spectacular than everything else combined. There's just no comparison between the greatness and the splendor and the beauty of God and any other thing. Now, the second part to this answer, after we recognize who God is and recognize His value, then secondly, to glorify God is to live your life in light of what we know about Him, in light of the fact that He is the greatest and the best and the most wonderful, to live in a way that demonstrates that we actually believe what we're saying. You see, it's one thing to say, uh, man, God is great. God is greatest. God is supreme. God is the most beautiful, the most wonderful, the most valuable. It's one thing to say it. It's another thing to believe it, to believe it. And if we do believe it, we will live according to what we're saying. All right, now I just want to give you a, a, a few illustrations that I'm going to read for you and explain to maybe give you some understanding of the supremacy or the greatness of God, that He's greater than absolutely everything. Um, the first, I want you to imagine that you have a, a scale or a balance, you know, um, a scale where if you put something on this side, it weighs it down and, and lifts up the other side, okay? If you put something on this side, it weighs it down and, and, uh, and lifts up the other side. Well, now, I want you to imagine that we weigh everything, everything that exists in heaven, earth, everything, and we put it on this side of the scale, okay? So everything that is, is in this scale right here. Well then, over here, this one goes down because it has everything in the universe in it, and this one goes up, all right? But now let's imagine that we put God on this side. What's going to happen? This is going to happen, just that quick, okay? God outweighs everything. And what I'm trying to say is that He's greater than everything else combined. There's just simply no comparison. Now, I want to read a, a text to you, a, a Bible verse, that I think will help us understand this. It says, Behold, this is from Isaiah 40, verse 15, and then verses 17 through 18. And it says this, Behold, hey, look. The nations are like a drop from a bucket and are regarded as a speck of dust on the scales. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are regarded by him as less than nothing and meaningless. To whom then will you liken God or what likeness will you compare with him? Wow, that's pretty amazing, isn't it? Now look, it says, behold, look, it's telling you to pay attention. God's going to tell us something very important. It's a truth that you must understand. And what is that truth? The nations are like a drop from a bucket and are regarded as a speck of dust on the scales. So imagine that you had those scales again. 
and you put, a, put all the nations here, everything that exists in this scale. But if God's on the other side, all those nations, they're like a little tiny speck of dust. And that's all. That's all. That's how great God is. Okay? It says that like a tiny drop of water from a bucket. I mean, we don't even know how large the universe is, and we can't even see how small it is. It is so great, and yet all of it combined is just like a little drop of water that falls out of a, a bucket compared to the greatness and the value and the importance of God. Now, he also says they are regarded, that is the nations, everybody that exists. They are regarded by him as less than nothing and meaningless. Now, what does that mean? You think, is God saying that uh, all the people on the earth mean nothing to him? Well, if that's the case, then uh, I don't mean anything to him and you don't mean anything to him. But that's not what this verse means. It means that if all the nations were to turn against God and fight against Him, if all the nations were to declare war on God, it would mean nothing. It would literally mean nothing. That all the greatest powers with all their bombs and armies and everything, they're nothing. It would be, I want you to imagine, if all the nations of the world and even all the angels and devils and everything, if they all decided to come together to fight against God. You know what it would be like? It would be like a, a, a little tiny gnat, a little tiny bug beating its head against a mountain of rock. Wouldn't that be ridiculous? They, they couldn't do anything. They couldn't affect him, change him at all. They couldn't overthrow his government. But, but here's what I want you to understand. It doesn't mean that uh, people are not important to God. How important are people? How much does God care about people? He cares about people so much that even though we were rebellious, even hating Him, disobeying His commands, He sent His Son, His only Son, to die for us. Now you say, wow, that means I'm really something important. Well, it does and it doesn't. You are important to God not because you and I deserve to be considered important. We are important because God is love. He loves us not because of some great value in us or some great thing that we've done. So I don't want you sticking your chest out and, and boasting and bragging about how great you are. I want you to realize that the reason why God cares for us, it's not because of us, it's in spite of us. God cares for us because God is love. And he proved it by sending his only son. Now, let's look at another illustration that I've written here for you. It's one of my favorites. And I'm just going to read it for you. Imagine collecting all the most beautiful things that ever existed in the whole world and putting them in one room. Now, that would be wonderful. I mean, it would just be wonderful. You could sit there for days and just look at all the beauty. I mean, you wouldn't need a television set. You wouldn't need some sort of video game. You could just sit there for days and look at all the beauty that you had collected from everywhere in the universe. Okay? But now listen. If God, if God walked into the room that room that contained all the most beautiful things of the universe, if God walked into that room, His beauty would be so great, so great that you would never want to look at those other beautiful things again because they would be ugly in comparison to God. That's how beautiful God is. Now, something that... Uh, let me tell you something that I think about God uh, that I believe that God, from the scriptures, the, the beauty, the way it talks about God and how great He is and spectacular and that no one can see Him, I believe that God is so beautiful that He will have to strengthen you 
supernaturally with his power just so that you can look at him. Because if he didn't, his beauty would be so great that it would even, well, we'd probably lose our mind, if not lose our life. Have you ever seen something that was so beautiful, like a sunset or a sunrise or something like that, that just took your breath away? Um, God would be so beautiful. He is so beautiful that it would take your breath away. You see, when I talk to you about um, believing in Jesus and following God and all these things, I'm not talking to you about a bunch of rules that you need to follow. I'm talking about looking upon God who is so beautiful that it will create such joy and life in your, in your life, okay? So to glorify God is to first of all see Him as He is so that you can live before Him in the way that you should. And that's not just obedience. That's not just obeying the rules. Um, it's joy. It's joy. It's um, living in a way in which literally almost every time you look at God, you lose your breath. That's what we're shooting for here. We don't want you just to know a bunch of things or to follow a bunch of rules. No, we, we want you to know God and, and to be filled with that joy that, that only God can give. All right, well, let's go on to another illustration. Imagine all the most intelligent men that ever lived. I mean, the smartest guys that ever lived on this planet, okay? And they were all sitting in a room and they were talking about all their great ideas, all the things that they had, had thought of, okay? It would be amazing to hear. I tell you, I have been with some people in the university in different places, whether they were physicists or, or just all sorts of smart people, scientists, and hear them talk about creation and I've just been amazed at how, wow, how smart they were and the things that they knew, all right? But now imagine this, compared to God, all the most brilliant men that have ever lived, okay? Compared to God, they know nothing. They know nothing. Now, let me read to you a really, just a wonderful verse from the Bible. It's Romans eleven thirty three through 34. And it says, Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or became his counselor? Who's ever taught God? Absolutely no one. God knows everything. And you know what else? He knows everything all at once. He knows everything without effort. He doesn't have to study the situation or consider it. He doesn't have to ask someone's opinion. He knows everything about everything. He knows it at all time and he knows it effortlessly. He doesn't even have to work to gain the knowledge. He is truth. He knows everything. And it says here, Paul says, Oh, the depths of the riches both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. He calls the wisdom and the knowledge of God, what God knows, he calls it to be riches. And you know who else does that? Someone I want you to be very familiar with, the writer of the book of Proverbs. He says that the knowledge of God is more valuable than silver or gold or anything. Now, if you want to be someone who is living in a way that they ought to live and doing what they were created for, you need to seek out God and seek out the riches of his wisdom and his knowledge. I'll tell you what, you need to consider yourself to be a treasure hunter and an explorer, okay, an adventurer. The treasure that you should seek is the knowledge of God. The thing that you should explore is not a thing at all, it's a person. And you can explore him throughout all of eternity and you're still not even going to come close to finding out everything about him. That's what makes him so wonderful. Now it says here that how unsearchable are his judgment and unfathomable his ways. Do you know the knowledge of God? Um, it's too deep. It's too high. It's too wide. Um, it's wonderful. 
but it's so far beyond us. Although we can know so many things about God, I want you to know that you'll be chasing that knowledge of God throughout all of eternity and you'll still have much more to explore. That's why eternity is not boring. You'll never come to the end of who God is. There'll be always much more marvelous things to know about Him. But there's also something else here important, uh, children. Very important. Um, God sometimes does things that we don't understand. And we just don't understand them. But we don't have to understand what God is doing if we know who God is. If I know that God is good and righteous and holy, then even though I may not understand what He's doing, I know that I can trust in Him. All right, well, let's go on to another illustration. It says, think about how much you owe your parents. And whether you know it or not, you owe them a lot. Okay, they gave birth to you. They give you food, clothing, and shelter. They do. You, you, your home, you're probably not paying for it. All right. If it were not for your parents, you would have nothing. You know, you were born, you didn't have clothes on. You were born with nothing and you would have nothing if it wasn't for the kindness of your parents. Now, think about this. Think about God and all that He does for you and your parents. Okay? He gave you life. He keeps you alive. Every beat of your heart and every breath that you breathe comes from Him. So that if you, if you owe your parents a great debt for what they have done for you, how much has God done for you? You know, I just... Uh, you know, one of the reasons we shouldn't disobey God and we shouldn't neglect God or, or, or put things in a higher place than God is that we literally owe everything that we are and every good thing that's ever happened to us, we owe God. God did that. It, it, I think I said this in the last teaching, you know, breathe in. That breath came from God. Feel your heart beat. Listen to it. Every one of those beats come from God. Now, God isn't up there saying, okay, I give you breath, I give you heartbeats now, for that reason, you owe me. He's a loving God, a very compassionate, merciful God. I am telling you that since in love and freely, without cost, He's given you life and breath and the beat of your heart, doesn't it just make sense? Isn't it just the right thing to do to serve Him? To serve Him above all others. Okay? Now, let's look at a very important verse here. Acts 17, 25. And this is what it says. Nor is He, that is God, served by human hands as though He needed anything. Do you see that? Someone may have told you at one time in your life that God made you because He was lonely. That's not true. God did not make you because He needed something. God made you because He is so full, just overflowing with life. So He didn't make you out of His need. He made you out of His super abundance. He has so much, it just flows from Him. And that is why he can always be counted on to be everything that you need him to be. Now, it says he's not served by human hands, even though we need to serve God. We should serve God. It's what we were made for. It's not that he needs us to serve him. It's that he's giving us the privilege, the joy of knowing him and serving him. As though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. You know... The person who receives breath and their heartbeat from God, the person who does that and worships God with all their heart, that's a wonderful thing. To receive a breath from God, to return it back to God in praise. To have our heart beat in order to make us strong, to let us live, to live for God. But here's something else you need to understand. The person who clenches his fist and shakes it at God because he hates God, he can only do that by the power that God gives him. Isn't that sad? The person who says horrible things about God 
and they curse God and they, 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 they treat God as something that's, that's horrible or maybe doesn't even exist. The person who does that, does that by the strength that God gives him. That's what makes it such a horrible crime. When we rebel and disobey God, we're using the gifts that he gave us in order to fight against him. We shouldn't do that. We should use everything that he gives us, everything, uh, in order to serve him and to serve others. Now, again, I always tell my little boys, Ian and Evan, I say, you know, why did God make you strong? He made you strong to serve him and to serve people who are not strong. Why did God uh, make you smart? He made you smart for his glory, to think great thoughts about him, but he also made you smart to help people who maybe struggle in that area or haven't had the privileges of an education like you, okay? So why did God make us strong? Why did he make us smart? And why did he make us wealthy? And you say, well, we're not really wealthy. Well, compared to most people in the world, you are wealthy. If you have a home and you know that you're going to eat today, you are wealthy. So why did God give us this privilege? So that we could use what we have to help other people, and especially children, not just with regard to giving them food and clothing, but also children to preach the gospel to them, to tell them about Jesus so that their life can be changed, so that God can be truly glorified in them. Now, here's another uh, good verse. It's one of my favorites. It's James 1.17. Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shifting of shadow. Every good thing. I mean, everything. I mean, my, my little boys like Legos. I don't know if any of you like Legos, but they do. And uh, even when I get them a new Legos set, I ask them, I say, where does this come from? And they'll go, oh, Dad, it comes from you. I say, no. Every good and perfect gift comes from God. Everything in your life that is good, everything is a gift from God. And that is why, you know, when, when the devil offers us something uh, that is not in agreement with what God wants, we shouldn't do it for many reasons. But one of the reasons why we shouldn't take what the devil offers us is because what God offers us is always good and perfect, and he's always been so good. Now, children, there is a sense in which you and I, we need to fear the Lord. We need to respect him. We need to know that there's a day of judgment coming when we will be judged with regard to what we have done. But even though that should um, move us and motivate us, one thing you need to know, children, is that the greatest motivation in our life, the thing that causes us to serve God, it should be the goodness of God. The goodness of God. God is so good. You know, one of the, one of the, the saddest things that I have to do is, is to tell people how good He is. And you say, well, Brother Paul, why, why, is, that, um, why is that sad? Well, because I always fail at it. You see, it's just absolutely impossible to describe to people how good God is. And I'm not kidding. I, I, I don't serve God because I just want to be a religious person who goes to church all the time. I serve God because He's good. And children, I want you to know His goodness. As the psalmist, that's one of the guys who wrote the Psalms, as he said, taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste and see. Now. Okay, let's go on. I have one more illustration for today. And uh, it says, imagine that you were locked away in a prison cell for one year for something that you had stolen. Okay, that'd be very frightening. Very dark prison cell. You were guilty and there was no reason why they should set you free. Okay, you really did it. It's not that they got it wrong. You really did steal. Okay, and you really deserve to be in that prison cell. It's not anybody else's fault but your own. You stole it, you did wrong, and now you're locked up. Now how grateful would you be if someone came and paid for your crime to let you go free? I mean, would you be happy? 
Would you uh, be thankful to that person who came and paid your crime? Paid for it. He says, whatever, whatever this child has stolen, I'm going to pay for it all. And you let that child go free. And that person pays for that, that crime that you committed, and they just let you out. Well, I don't know about you, but I would uh, want to be very good friends with that person. I would appreciate them. I would say, thank you very much. Is there anything I can do? I appreciate what you've done for me. Okay, now think about this. Now, you are so guilty that you should die and be shut out of heaven. Now, I know that that sounds really hard, but children, I told you I'm going to teach you the Bible. I'm not going to lie to you or tell you fairy tales. The Bible teaches that all of us are guilty of crimes against God. And not only should we be shut up in a prison, we should be shut up out of heaven. We should be locked out. We do not deserve to be there. We should not know the goodness of God, the beauty of God, the joys of God. We should be locked out of that for all eternity because we have broken God's law. It's, it's what we've done. Now, I, I don't like to make people feel bad, but you need to understand this. It's just true. You say, well, I'm just a little kid. I haven't done that much. Have you disobeyed your parents? You have violated the law of God. Have you lied? You have violated the law of God. Um, have you, uh, do you think about things and desire things more than God? You know, are your Legos more important than knowing God and serving Him? You see, all those things are sins. Have you heard before about Jesus and yet not paid much attention to that? Well, that's sin. And we ought to be shut out of heaven we ought to experience the justice and the judgment of God. But now look, let me read on. You are so guilty that you should die and be shut out of heaven for all of eternity. But God sent his own son to die for your sins. How much more should you appreciate God for what he has done? Um, there is no greater illustration of love or the love of God than when Jesus Christ died on the cross for you. You and I have sinned and because God is a good God, he must judge evil. He must judge bad things. You and I have done evil. We have done bad things. God should judge us. But in his great love for us, he judged sin. By, his son, sin, by sin being placed upon His only Son. And when Jesus was on the cross, all the punishment that should have fallen upon you and me, it fell upon Him. You and I should be forsaken of God, but when He was on the cross, He cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You and I should experience the anger and the judgment of God in a place called hell throughout all of eternity. But on the cross... Jesus suffered his father's anger against us. Jesus suffered his father's judgment against us. He died for us. Now, how should we live? Well, we should believe him. We should believe what God has done. We should believe in Jesus. We should stop believing in ourselves. We should not trust in our religion or our good works or some thing like baptism or the fact that we read our Bibles or that we're homeschooled or anything. Nothing will take away our sins. Nothing. There is nothing we can offer God. But Jesus offered his life in our place. And now we can be saved through believing in Jesus, trusting in him. Now, listen to Romans uh, chapter five, verse seven. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man, someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrated his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The Bible says that, man, it would be really amazing if there was a good man who was in trouble and another man came and died in his place to save him. We would call that man who died a great hero. 
because he died for a good man who should have been saved. But now what I want you to see is this. Jesus did something far greater. God did something far greater than that. God sent his son to die for us when we were not good men. Our good children. God sent his son to die for us when we did not love God and did not follow his commands. So you see, God loved us even though we did not deserve to be loved. And that is an amazing thing. Now, let's also look at 2 Corinthians 5.14. For the love of Christ controls us, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Now, I know I just I said a lot, didn't I? It's very kind of kind of hard to understand. But here's the point that I want you to get. It's this one phrase. He died for all so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again. Children. You see, the reason why we believe in God and we love God and, and we want to serve God is because of what God did for us. While we were yet sinners, deserving to die and deserving to be separated from God forever, God sent his son. You see, I mean, his son and his son died for us. And because of that, we believe in him and want to serve him and love him. You know, um, I uh, have served the Lord and for, for a while, and I've served him also in some very difficult situations at times. And you want to know why? In a sense, in a way, I feel like I'm a, I'm a prisoner. And you say, you're a prisoner? Yes, I am a prisoner to the love of Christ. You see, that's kind of what Paul is saying here. He's saying, when he discovered how much God loved him by giving his son for him, he just felt like he had to serve God, that he wanted to serve God, that he wanted to bless God and please God because Jesus died for him. And that's the, that's the way I want you to see it. We don't, we, don't, um, we don't just follow the Bible because it's the right thing to do or because it'll give us a better life. We follow the Bible because of who God is and what God has done. He is so wonderful. And what he's done for us in Christ is it just goes beyond anything a man can say. You know, remember when I told you that it was kind of sad to be a preacher because you couldn't communicate to people how good God is? You know that every time you try, you fail. Um, that's especially true with regard to the cross of Christ. A man could be the smartest man in the world and the most spiritual man in the world and have the greatest ability to speak and he would still not be able to share with other people how wonderful God is and the wonderful thing that God has done for us in Jesus Christ. That's what should control your life. Why should you obey your mom and dad? Because Jesus died for you. Why should you love your brothers and sisters even when sometimes uh, you don't think they deserve it? Because Jesus died for you. Why should you read your Bible and pray and praise God and every good thing that you should do? Why should you do it? Because Jesus died for you. Okay? What is the greatest way to glorify God? Believe in His Son. Serve His Son. Bless his son. You know, I don't pray that, that you or my children will be great preachers or great missionaries or famous. What I pray is this, that God will give each of you a heart that is uniquely devoted to his son and that you'll live a life of honoring God's son. All right, well, we touched on the first part of what it means to glorify God, that we should recognize how wonderful He is, how wonderful His Son is, and the wonderful thing His Son has done for us. In the next session, we're going to talk about the other part of how do we glorify God, and that is not only recognizing how, God is, how good God is, 
but live in a way that shows that we really believe that God is worthy and God is good. Until then, I pray that you will prosper in all the things that God has for you. God bless you. Please visit our website at heartcrymissionary.com. There you will find information about the ministry, our purpose, beliefs and methodologies, and extensive information about the missionaries we are privileged to serve.